Thank you all. Thank you, Nancy, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be the first of the last, and so uh, really appreciative of the opportunity. Thank you all for coming. I know you all have lots to do tonight. You could be doing something else, and I appreciate you all being here. I spent more time writing the title than I did on the presentation. And I'm not kidding, Nancy must have wrote me 17 times in about three weeks ago, where's the title? I need a title and a picture. Uh, I found a picture, but I couldn't find a title because I just couldn't figure out what I was gonna do. And so I came up with this in the very last moment because she said I need it by noon and it was like 11.45 and I finally got this put together. There was three or four other titles I gave her. This is the one she chose. I'm looking forward to sharing a bit of my story and a bit of the story I would give to any student if I was doing, actually doing a last lecture and had only 35 or 40 minutes to talk to a, a bunch of students or anybody, this is what I would be telling them. This would be my lecture for them. Nancy mentioned Randy Pausch was actually the first last lecturer. He discovered he was dying of cancer and he wrote this last lecture and delivered it uh, at Carnegie Mellon and then he re-delivered it again on the Oprah show which is pretty interesting and I'll share a little bit of that with you. If I'm not morose enough for you, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I don't choose to be an object of pity. And in fact, although I'm gonna die soon, I'm actually physically very strong. In fact, I'm probably physically stronger than most of the people in this audience. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, will you hold this while I, no, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so I'm not gonna do that. But he was very, uh, he was very, uh, his story was so moving, and he talked so much about the things that were really meaningful to him. And it touched a lot of people. It touched me when I first heard about it, and to have the opportunity to kind of repeat what he did uh, without being diagnosed with cancer uh, is really a great honor for me, and so I'm happy to share the story. Now, the question I had when I first was approached by Nancy was, why me? Admiral Stockdale, your opening statement, please, sir. Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> That was the vice presidential debate in 1992. <laughs> That's how I feel, why am I here? Why isn't Kyle Harper here? Or David Boren, these people who are so elegantly gifted in speaking, and, and I, I do take a great honor, I, I don't know why I'm here, except for perhaps this is not the first time I've given a last lecture. I've given this last lecture about 50 times in the past two months. Usually I'm naked, or I'm riding, one time I was riding my bike past Zero Hall and Nancy Waite, it's today, it's right now, and I went, really right now? Or I'm sitting in my underwear in the front row and she says, this is your time to do this thing. And so I have this, it's actually, I've replayed this moment year after year, for, for day after day, nightmares uh, about this moment here. So I've, this is my 51st time to do the fifth, this, this last lecture and hopefully we'll get this thing right. So Nancy asked me to address at least three of what they call the sooner virtues uh, that, uh, that the Center for Human Flourishing or the Institute for Human Flourishing uh, pays attention to. And I chose perseverance, that's staying on the path, sticking with something, intellectual humility, that's facing up the truth about your own intellectual abilities, but also admitting the limitations that they have, and then compassion, feeling sorrow for other people's suffering. And there's another thing about compassion, it's not just feeling sorry for them, but being willing to take action to help them out. And what I will be talking about a lot today is not m necessarily uh, my compassion or my intellectual humility or persever perseverance, but the people who encouraged me to at least express some of that. So that's what I'll be sharing with you all today. So the, the title of this one is of Confessions, Transgressions, Intercessions, Obsessions. There were other titles. There was one, uh, he, he had no clue, so he talked to a guy. That was actually suggested by somebody else. And then uh, this is one I almost went with. That time I cried, I lied, I almost died and, and decided to commit suicide. And so I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna actually talk about all four of those at the end here. Don't get, it's not too terrible, the suicide part's not too bad, so I'll get to that in a little bit. So uh, yesterday I was talking to one of my friends and she said, was encouraging me, she said, I can't be there tomorrow, I can't wait to hear about it. And she said, just remember this Kelly, it's not about you. The last lecture is never about you. <laughs> I said, well, Great, I gotta change my whole presentation now. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, who is it? So it's really not about me. It's about nine people who changed my life, who invested in me and inspired me to help, I hope, when I have chance to inspire someone else's lives. And so I base this on, this, uh, on my research and the, and the, and the uh, studying I have done in the past 30 years since I started working on my PhD on two sets of literatures, life course research and terrorism research. And the big question is how do people become terrorists or what happens? How do people who are living in the same household 
end up being one way and their brother or sister is totally different. And life course research looks a little bit like this. You're born and then you die. And something happens in the middle and life course research is dedicated to understanding how that happens. Now here's an example for me. Uh, I was born, I had a life, I gave a last lecture, and I'll die sometime. So that's, a, that's the beginning of understanding uh, life course research. This is what I hope happens. <laughs> I actually have a longer life after I give the last lecture before I die, but eventually that will happen. Someday, though, for some people, they have a birth, they have a life, some life event happens, and they have a very short time and death happens after that. And it's even more tragic sometimes. A birth, a life event, sometimes that life event causes you to go in one direction, and that life event causes you to go in another direction, and then you die. But some people have different life events, worse like life events that cause you to go in a different direction, or might cause them to go in a different direction, and their life is decidedly different from someone who experienced a, a, a positive life event. Uh, there are other people right off, very early in life, discover or, or, or experience a negative life event, uh, death of a parent or something tragic happening early on, and that can have neg negative consequences as well, leading to, a, again, a life that is near, not nearly as rich as someone who had a stronger life event earlier in life. Some people's early tragic life event uh, actually leads them to a place we don't even know where they are, where they completely drop off the face of the earth. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about this, this whole idea. We talk about terrorists, how people get from here to there, where most people are born somewhere in the middle and some people get on one extreme or the other, and then some people at some point decide to do something violent to become a terrorist. How do you, what causes you to go over that, to take that leap to go over the edge? And so we talk, when I, when I, study life course research and I, when, I, when I study terrorists, I, I have been thinking also about myself and my own life that I've led. And so we'll start there. So how did I get from here to there? How did that little boy get from Lac La Biche, Alberta, get down to Norman and live this life? Well, I talked to a guy and so that's where we're going here. So this is me. Uh, I know, I was, uh, this is the awe moment right here, right? So I was born. And, um, and so now we'll start talking about the people who influenced my life, who affected my life and the first people I'm going to talk about are my parents, Edna and Louis Dampfus, 1963. Now you'll notice there's a little bit of a time lag between birth and that little arrow. And that's because uh, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, and, uh, but I don't know my birth parents. I don't know the people who gave birth to me or, or were my natural mother and father. But I do know my parents. And they're the people who at some time in their life decided to give of themselves to invest their lives in people they didn't know. And they adopted me, then they adopted my little sister, and another little sister. So all three of us kids are adopted. That's my dad down here. And this, is, this picture was taken about 1939, 1940, 1941, that era. If that looks like kind of hard scrabble Oklahoma during the uh, dust, uh, dust Bowl era, that's kind of like what Saskatchewan was in, in Canada. Tough times. My grandpa right there and my grandmother right there lost the farm, lost everything they had. My grandpa got a job working in a coal mine. Grandma was a cook. She made more money being a cook than he did working in the coal mine. And my dad grew up in a pretty, pretty tough situation. Graduated, got a 12th grade education, took a couple of accounting classes at night and got a job in Alberta where, where, where times were good. Uh, there's my mom. My mom grew up in Alberta. She was a city girl, but she had a tough life as well. She was uh, very late in, in my grandparents' uh, lifetime, born to them. Uh, her brothers and sisters were all fighting in, in World War II when she was born, around that era. And I'm not sure what the circumstances were, but at some point they put her in an orphanage. So she was in a Catholic or orphanage being raised by nuns and, le and led a really tough life until she met my dad. They got married, uh, couldn't have kids, and so they decided to adopt, and they adopted me in 1963. And I never forget the fact I try not to forget the fact about how they were so unselfish, how they invested their life in me and gave everything they had for us. And I remember times when I didn't appreciate that. I do remember a time specifically. It may have been like 50 years ago, uh, 40 years ago today. Who knows? I was shoveling snow in Canada, sidewalk, that's what you do. And I literally was thinking, the only reason they adopted me was so that I would, they would have someone to shovel the snow out here. <laughs> I literally thought that. 
And I remember another time where I wasn't very appreciative. My mom and dad didn't have much money. We lived in a trailer court. Um, and I wanted a, a set of goalie equipment. And goalie equipment is very expensive. And uh, we had Christmas, and I unwrapped the presents, and I didn't get the goalie equipment that I wanted. And I remember throwing a bit of a tantrum. And uh, went to my bedroom, and I was crying, and I was throwing things around. And my mom came in and said, we were going to surprise you with this tomorrow, but here it is for you. And I just remember thinking, how terrible a <laughs> kid I am. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. And it reminds me every time I think about that, how much they cared about me and were thoughtful about me, even though uh, they didn't have to. All of us have people in our lives who, who have uh, invested themselves in us that didn't have to. And that's one of the lessons of this story here is investing in other people that you don't have to and loving them. They love me regardless. Here's my sister's, <laughs> this is Christmas morning. Uh, someday, <laughs> poor dad in his pajamas. I'm, he'll be mortified to know I put a picture of him in his pajamas up here. Uh, that's the three kids he raised. They also were foster parents. And uh, we lived in a little small town in northern Alberta. And when bad things happened somewhere, the Mounties would go in there to that situation, they would take a kid, pull the kid out of the house, and bring them to our house, and those kids would live with us for two weeks, or three weeks, or a month, or two months, or whatever. My mom must have raised 50 kids as, fo as, as a foster parent. Unofficial foster parent, not getting paid for it. There were no social workers in town. Uh, but I've never forgotten, just the kids just coming in, living with us, and moving out. Again, people of relatively poor means, and the investment they made in other people, which is incredible. It, also, it had a huge influence in my life as well because we had all those Mounties coming into our house all the time and I loved those Mounties. I was a little guy and they were always so big and they wore the red coats and the brown hats and I thought they were the coolest guys in the world so I really decided about that time that I wanted to be a police officer. So we grew up in this little town called Lac Labiche, way up north, northern Alberta. There's a high speed chase in uh, northern Alberta. <laughs> and so it gets, there's a helicopter view, it's really exciting here. So. But I wanted to be a police officer so badly. I really did. But I wanted to be a police officer and or somehow served, just like my parents served in a very formal. You see, Lac La is way up there north of Edmonton, uh, in the middle of, of nowhere. Uh, and so I wanted to wear the uniform. So this, I remember, you know, you, you don't remember many things when you're this age, but I remember this outfit. I remember where I wore it every day. That's why they took the picture of it, I'm sure. I love that, that outfit. I don't remember the chubby legs and the shoes. But anyways, <laughs> I do remember that. This is a picture of me, uh, this is one of the few pictures that exists of me and my dad together at that age. Uh, that's actually me, a local newspaper reporter came to town and took this picture. Uh, I really appreciate mom putting me in those striped pants and having my backside towards the camera. But there's my dad who's the, who's the Cub Scout. Those were all his boys, right? And so, uh, and I, I, wore, I wore that Cub Scout uniform every day to school. And so, uh, that's, a, that's my school picture there. And so I just wanted to, the uniform is so important to me. And, uh, or I would have been happy with a goalie uniform, I would be in the NHL, that would have been really cool. So there's me on the front row as a goalie. I went, to, I went to Disney World one time, Disneyland actually, and if it looks like I'm like a little sad there, because I am, I cried for about two hours until my mom would let me take that picture. Uh, but I wanted, I, that was the only thing, closest thing they had to a Mountie uniform, so I put that on. Uh, so again, just didn't quite happen. So around this time, so this is about 10th grade now, uh, uh, I had an experience with one of my teachers, Mr. Jim McNinch. What I didn't ri realize, uh, was that's, that, this, is the, this is actually the picture in my mind of Mr. McNinch. That's not, actually not him. If you remember the Paper Chase movie, that's, but that's the guy right there. That's not, what he, that's, that's not his picture, but that's, in my mind that's what he looks like. Or it was something like this. I mean, this guy was, he had glasses and long hair and kind of hippie looking. This is him now. He's actually like a professor at the University of Regina. He had a PhD from Sussex, England, and he came to Lac La Biche. I don't know what happened, what crimes he committed <laughs> to have him there. But I love this guy. He was like the ultimate, rad and I'm not even a radical guy, but he was really cool. He had long hair and glasses, and, and, uh, and he really, I loved him. And so I had him in ninth grade English and 10th grade English. And um, uh, I remember one time in the back of the room, uh, I was jacking around doing something. Who knows what I was doing back there. And he was sitting there and he finally he said, Kelly, I, what? Oh God, he caught me. He said, what the heck happened to you? Your brain has turned to mush. You were a great student last year and now you're acting like a complete idiot. And he didn't know what had happened the previous summer, what had happened before that. But it was the first time in my life that someone from outside my family had expressed something like, you can be more than what you're being and you're just being a, a goofball. And, and, and I, that one moment, that one conversation, I've never forgotten that. And I know 
because I've asked him. He doesn't remember saying that. But that moment changed my life. T made me think that other people see something in me that I don't see in myself. It's a small moment in time, but that guy changed my life. I put down there, he's my Nathan. There's an ancient uh, biblical story about Nathan, who was a prophet who went to King David and told him a story about this guy who had done a terrible thing. And David said, we should punish that guy. And he said, you're the man. You're the guy I'm talking about. And that's what Jim McNitch did for me. He told me something really hard. And another lesson to learn is sometimes your friends, the people you love, need to be told tough things. And he did that for me. It changed my life, began to get me to th get serious about what happens to my future, not wait for it to happen to me, but make it happen. So I graduated, we moved down south. I went to this little, ju little ju uh, junior college, community college in, in Lethbridge, Alberta. And uh, this is my law enforcement class. You see everybody there's 18 or 19 years old. They all have great mustaches. And I do not, because I was only 17 when I went to college. There's me in the back, right there, handsome guy. My only suit I ever owned in my life before I moved to, to Oklahoma, maybe. I don't know, <laughs> for a long time anyways. Um, but I went there with the goal of becoming a Mountie or at least becoming a police officer of some kind, and things didn't work out. I, I graduated when I was 19 years old from college, and I, could, I can't believe this still, uh, that no police department would hire me to be a police officer, give me a fast car and a gun. Uh, now I'm, I can't believe they didn't. I'm so glad they didn't. Who knows how many people I would have killed over, the, over those times. Uh, and I'm not sure some of these guys, I'm not sure where some of these guys ended up, uh, kind of scary, but looking bunch there. Uh, but I graduated in 1982, and things weren't working out to me and so for me, and I ended up going to prison for a while. That means, oh, I didn't have the next picture up here. I, went to, I was a prison guard in prison there for a while. <laughs> and so, so I went to prison. I worked in prison for about three years. And you can imagine, you know, I'm thinking Mountie, and then I'm thinking police officer of any kind, even a highway patrol. They don't have, in, can't, in Alberta, highway patrol doesn't have guns. And I was like, that's like the lowest of the police departments. And then now prison guard. So I'm like right at the bottom. Well, I'm not quite at the bottom. You, it goes lower, and I'll, I've been there, so I'll tell you more about that later. But I was, uh, there's, there's me in the back row there, uh, prison guard for about three years, and it was a terrible experience. It was so terrible, and I, because I was so terrible, because I didn't want to be a guard. And uh, my evaluation at the end of my second year was something like, uh, it literally said, Damphus, having you come to work is like having two good men out sick. And <laughs> yes, very inspiring, you know. I, <laughs> When I first read that, I was like, I'm not, how do I interpret that? I'm not sure, but, but it didn't take me long to interpret that. And, and my, my life started there to take a downward spiral. I was, not, I was not doing the thing I wanted to do. I wasn't good at it, uh, and I just didn't know what I was going to do. I literally be began to think of myself doing a life sentence eight hours at a time. I was just trying to get through, get my 20 years in and get out. My life, all my plans, and I, was, I really was believing that only special people got to become Mounties or had their life work out for them. And I'm just one of those not special people. And, because, and when you start thinking of yourself as not special, you start caring about what you're doing. And I was doing a lot of things I'm not at all proud of now. And my life was starting to go to heck in a handbasket. And so I decided to commit suicide. No, that's not why. <laughs> but something happened here. I, I went to, uh, I decided to go skydiving. I don't know why. I'd never been in a plane before in my life. And I decided, well, let's, and I was doing lots of stuff uh, uh, that was uh, just kind of edgy stuff, trying to get some excitement back in my life. I decided to go skydiving. And for me, skydiving wouldn't be that scary. I'm afraid of heights, by the way. But I thought, you know, well, I'll get up there, and that's what it will look like when I go out the window. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys have been skydiving, but that's what it looks like when you go outside the window. <laughs> 3,000 feet in the air. And so we're in this little, tiny, little airplane, and because I'm the heavier guy, I'm the first one out. My best friend is sitting behind the pilot who's on a Coke case, wooden Coke crate, because they've stripped the whole plane out so they get more people in there. And there's two young ladies behind me, and my instructor's right in front of me. And we're flying, and I look out there, and I said, you know, it's not, this is just really high. It's not, like, up there. I can see people looking at me. I, there's my car. <laughs> and so... So I started getting really scared, and I thought, well, certainly we'll get higher than this, but we never got higher. We got to 3,000 feet, and he said, uh, my instructor says, okay, time to go, and she opens the door up, and it, now it's like 90 miles an hour, and the wind's rushing in, and I got my pack on, and you have to literally, in this plane, you have to climb out and put one foot on the step, grab the, grab the thing that goes like this, hang on to the door, and you're dangling one foot, and then you say, you're ready, and she says, go. 
and I just, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I, I divide, literally on the spot devised this plan. I'm just going to pretend I can't hear her say go. <laughs> so I get up there and I'm hanging on and she says, all right. And I say, ready. And she says, go. And I said, I'm ready. And she says, go. And I said, I'm ready. And we kept going back and she starts shaking me ooh, ooh, like this. <laughs> And, I'm trying to, and the plane's wobbling because it's a real light plane. And I look back at my buddy, and he's like, don't go, don't go, because he's next. <laughs> don't go. He says, don't go. <laughs> then I look at the two young ladies behind me, and they're like, are you some kind of chicken or something? And I said, I would rather die than to have those girls think that I'm a chicken. So I committed suicide. I literally cannonballed out of the plane like this. <laughs> and that's not how you're supposed to jump out. You're supposed to jump and make a parabola and so on. And it was really embarrassing. But then it, I got out. I survived somehow. Uh, but I literally, I remember going home that night thinking, what, what, what kind of guy am I? I'm, I'm, I would rather kill myself than be embarrassed in front of people. And, uh, and it really was like one of those shifts in my life. Like, I got to change things here. And I didn't really commit suicide or decide to commit suicide. But I literally thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to jump out and die. But I just wanted to get out of that plane and not be embarrassed anymore. And, and maybe that's a way to get over this. But it was like a, a defining moment for me. Like, I need to do something, and someone needs to intercede, and that's what happened. Not, not a month later, Mr. Harrison bumps into me in downtown Lethbridge, and he's, he's one of my former instructors. He's an ex-Mountie. I love this guy. I looked up to him. He's like six foot four. I don't know how tall he really was, but I just love this guy. And he saw me. I was so embarrassed. I was fat, and I hadn't shaved for three days. I was wearing my uniform. It was all wrinkled. And he saw me, and I remember the almost disgust in his face. We looked at me and said, Kelly, what, what happened to you? You hadn't seen me for three years. And I said, well, I'm working in the pr local prison. I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I shouldn't be out here. And he said, hey, why don't you come over to my house on Sunday? I'm building a sidewalk. I know you've done construction. Come over and help me build a sidewalk. And so I said, okay, whatever. I'll help you out. I went over to his house and he sat me down. We built a sidewalk for a while. And he said, here, sit down. Let's have a beer. Had a beer. That's what Canadians do. And uh, he said, you can do better. Do kind of the Jim McNinch thing. You, 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 you were something. You, you could be something. You could be somebody. And I've got a, I've got a, a plan for you. Uh, a friend of mine runs a criminal justice program down at a small school down in Texas called Sam Houston State. And he'll, he'll take all your community college credit and let you go down there, get your four-year degree in criminal justice, come back and be a Mountie. And I said, oh, Texas, where, I don't even know where that, where, where is Texas? Had to get a map out to look for it. <laughs> I'd heard of it. I'd heard of the Dallas Cowboys because of football, but that's about all I knew about Texas. And, and uh, he said, no, go down there. It'd be great. And so I sold, I literally, on that conversation that afternoon, sold everything. It took me a year to do this. Sold everything I had. I bought a motorcycle on December 12th, 1984. My friend who had, was going with me, who was the guy in the pilot, behind the pilot who didn't want me to jump out, he decided to do the same thing. We sold everything we had. We bought motorcycles. He taught me how to drive a motorcycle in his parents' garage. Uh, I could only turn left forever. Cause that's all I knew how to do. <laughs> I never got the third gear, so I'd, I don't know what happened after two. But uh, in, in August, uh, July of 1985, we rode our, our motorcycles from Lethbridge down to Huntsville, Texas, and decided to go to school there. That conversation, that two-hour investment in my life, changed my life forever by him saying, I'm going to work out a plan for you. Now, the blessing of my life, one of the many blessings of my life, was that when I went down there, I got to start over again on grades. I had a 2.56 GPA when I graduated in junior college, and I got to start over with a zero. And I, I remember one day I studied for a history exam. I had never studied for an exam. I didn't know you're supposed to do that. I bought the book. I read it. And I got like a 92 on it. I thought, hey, that, that kind of worked out. And so I kept studying, and I got pretty good grades. And somehow I graduated. Uh, but then other things happen. I ended up not moving back to Canada. There, there I am. Uh, that's inside my dorm room. I actually have wallpapered my entire dorm room with these life-size posters of Mounties uh, <laughs> all over. My roommate was a little nervous about what I, I wasn't necessarily sharpening knives over there or anything, but I was probably a little intense. I had actually, this t-shirt, well, I'll go back here, sorry. This t-shirt that I'm wearing, I actually made it myself. I bought it somewhere. I cut the sleeves off, and I went to those t-shirt stores and wrote law enforcement on the back. I had it stamped on there. And I wore that all the time. I wore it out. That's why I had to cut the sleeves off. I was just so intense. I wanted to be a Mountie so badly. Uh, but things didn't work out because I met this girl. 
So I met Beth Smith, and so she's beautiful, right? And so, uh, and she sings like a bird, and I fell in love with her the moment I saw her, and it took me a while to convince her to date me, and she, in fact, she wouldn't date me, because she's very practical. She's like my youngest daughter, very practical. My oldest daughter's more like me, but my, uh, <laughs> Chris, Kristen's laughing now. So, but she said, why would I date someone I wouldn't want to marry, and I'm not going to marry a Canadian, because I'm not going to move to Canada, and I don't want to marry a cop, so I'm not going to date you. And I said, I don't need to be a cop. I don't need to be a Canadian. <laughs> Forget all that stuff. <laughs> you can see I was obsessed with being a cop, I mean, with being with Beth, yeah. So, so I gave that all up, and so I love some of these old pictures. I love that dress, because I thought I was so rich that she could have this dress. It's such a cool dress. <laughs> I don't know about the hairdo, but the dress was so cool. I can still uh, fit in that tie, by the way. <laughs> so there we are a couple years later. Uh, uh, we've been happily ma married. Uh, I've been happily married the whole time. She's been happily married most of the time. And so uh, we lead a great life. We're so happy here. Uh, I mentioned, though, that I lied. This is one of the times I lied. Uh, I was always going to go back to Canada, and I was always going to be a Mountie. I thought I could talk her out. Don't tell her I said that, but this is one of the times I lied. So suicide and lied. We got that going here. So, remember <laughs> Mountie, and then uh, any kind of police officer, then even highway patrol, then, then uh, high, uh, correctional officer? I said there was something lower, this is it. So I went and worked for Macy's, Kelly Danfoss Mall Cop. And so here I am, undercover <laughs> mall cop. I didn't have a uniform. I wasn't happy with the, with, the, with the thing that went around. I didn't have that. So I worked security for a while at Macy's, and then Beth and I got married eventually. And, uh, and she talked me into going to grad school. And she, uh, I would never even thought of, again, special people do things like that. I don't. And, uh, and she talked me into going, and so I ended up doing that. But the reason she was able to talk me into it was because of her dad. So Olin Smith there, uh, has got his PhD from University of Minnesota. He was this big guy, strong as an ox. Um, <laughs> scared the life out of me. And just really intimidated me. But I remember he said a couple things, did a couple things, that made me say, well, if, if he thinks I can do this, maybe I can do it. He actually walked my, uh, this is back in the old days, before the internet, but he actually walked my application uh, around Texas A&M because he and Beth thought that'd be a good place for me to go to graduate school because that's where he worked. And, uh, and, and helped me so much, provide so much guidance to me. I was, he was the adult in my life that helped me uh, so much to kind of get through that transition of being a young, dumb adult into eventually being a father. And so I have him to thank for that, and he's one of those guys that made a huge impact in my life as well. Went to Texas A&M, I got my master's degree studying Satanism and drugs and prison and crime and so on. I had babies, both my girls. Pretty interesting. But when I went to A&M, I was there for a, maybe three months and I was going to drop out. Maybe three weeks, I don't know. I, I didn't like that at all because I was going into sociology and I was a criminal justice guy. And sociology people are, well, Tom, you're a sociologist. We're, we're not like, we don't think like police officers all the time, right? I don't know another way to say it. And I just didn't feel like I fit in. And the chair of the department was walking down the hallway and she casually said, hey, Kelly, how's it going? And I said, oh, it's going terrible. And I think about dropping out. And I think I surprised her because usually when you say, how's it going, you don't really want to know how it's going. <laughs> and I told her, Canadians can be very blunt sometimes. And so I told her it was terrible and I told her what was going on and how I wanted to be a police officer and this just isn't working out. And, uh, and, sh and she said, have you talked to Ben Crouch? And I said, I don't know who Ben Crouch is. And she, he said, she said, he's a criminologist just like you. He studies prisons. And so I, this Friday afternoon, took me to his office. I spent an hour and a half in his office. He stopped what he was doing. And he said, OK, Monday, you're not going to work for Barbara anymore. You're going to work for me. I got a closet across the hallway. We'll clear it out. We'll put a desk in there. You'll be my assistant. And we'll do criminology things together. And I thought, OK, I went home, I only told, went home and told Beth, OK, I'm not dropping out now. <laughs> I think I got something going on. That guy, this guy, Ben Crouch, I put that picture up here because I love, he's a, he's a bluegrass player and he loves playing the guitar. But that's Dr. Crouch and in, in a half an hour on a Friday afternoon when he was really busy, he was an undergraduate advisor, had a bunch of students he had to deal with, he took the time to stop and help this punk kid and walk me through life as a graduate student at Texas A&M. And I remember as clear as day, one day, riding to Brownsville, Texas. And we we're collecting data, and it rained that day. Just as we got it, it was pouring down rain. Texas, you just have to wait. The rain's going to go by, right? And so we, were, we sat out in the parking lot, waiting for the rain to go by. We didn't have umbrellas. And we start talking, and I was about to have our first child. And I said, I can't wait. I, I hope it's a boy. 
because if it's a boy, we'll play football together and baseball, and I could probably make it. I'll be famous because my son will be famous. And, uh, and he said, if you're lucky, you'll have girls, because I have two girls, and it's awesome. And he didn't say awesome. We didn't say awesome back then, but he said something like awesome. And I said, girls, that's a terrible idea. Why would I want girls? I, I don't know what I'd do with them. He, and he went on to tell me. He shared with me how great girls are and how great his girls were. And I said, okay, maybe. And then uh, we had this long conversation, and I said to him at some point at the end, I said, Dr. Crouch, I don't know how I'll ever be able to thank you for all the things you've done for me. I was going to quit school, and I, you helped me so much, and I was nearing the end of my graduate program, and he, I'll never forget he said, uh, you don't have anything I want. You can't repay me any, anyway. And I thought, well, that wasn't very nice of him to say that. <laughs> but then he said, we're, we were sitting in his, in his Buick, and he says, someday, though, You'll be sitting behind the steering wheel, and someone else will be sitting in the passenger seat. And you'll do for him or for her what I've done for you, and that's how you'll pay me back. And that has been the driving force of everything I've done from that moment on, thinking about how I can help other people because of what he did for me. And it reminds me so much of the uh, ending scene of Private Ryan when, uh, when, the cap when Captain Miller is dying, and he reaches up and he grabs Private Ryan, and he says, what? Earn this. And, uh, uh, and I've always thought I'm trying to earn all the things that, pres uh, that, pres that uh, Ben Crouch has done for me ever since. I, I love that man because he changed my life so much. Two more people changed my life. Kaylee and Kristen, they came along, <laughs> totally changed, wrecked my life. They're not very good at football. They'll never be football stars. I'll never be famous because of their football attitude. But uh, these kids uh, changed my life tremendously in a way that I'll never forget. And I love uh, that picture on the right that shows us we went to Disneyland by ourselves and it was like 20 years after I'd been there with my parents it was just the three of us and we went on this ride and uh, you can see me in the back I hate roller coasters but I did everything they wanted to do and we had so much fun here but they also taught me about music and so I love music and you guys know this right so I love a little Taylor Swift so it's really good so they taught me all kinds of stuff they keep me young and if it wasn't for them I wouldn't be able to know this great music You know, I wouldn't know about this stuff for out without for them. It's taught me so much. They've influenced me so much. <laughs> so, anyways, so it's been it's it's funny how your kids influence you and teach you as well. We have this thing we always talk about here about uh, we take lots of selfies together. And I I one time accidentally said I live you and said I love you. And I said you know what? I'm just going to leave it in there. And I always type no typo on there. I really mean that. I live them. They've become my life. They've become the reason I do stuff now. And I, and I was so, it was so fun watching them live now and grow on their own. They influence me so much. Now I'll tell you about the time I almost died, and I'll be real quick with this one. This one was scary, though. I went to Brazil one time. My wife told me not to go to Brazil, but I always listened to her except for this one time. And I went to Brazil. She said, don't go down there. You'll get mugged. I said, no, I won't get mugged. I'll be fine. Well, I went down there, and I got mugged. <laughs> and... <laughs> Literally, I got mugged, and this was the hotel that I was at, and I went out on the beach. I thought, I'll take pictures of the beach and the hotel. It'll be really great. And these two guys and me were the only ones on the beach, and uh, they came and got me, and they got me. They got me right there. That's where they, they tracked me down. I was kind of like walking really fast trying to get away from them, but not be subtle. I would try to be subtle about it, uh, but they caught me. And they came up, and they each had a broken bottle, and one of them put it to my neck, and the other one put it right here, and they started yelling at me in Portuguese. And I couldn't understand what they wanted. Well, I kind of knew what they wanted, <laughs> but I couldn't understand what they were saying. But luckily, because of my deft ninja skills, I thought, I can just outrun these guys. Now, I look kind of like I do now, and they didn't. And so, but I turned, and I may have gotten two steps. I'm not sure, one or two steps before they caught me. I mean, I was, it was ridiculous that I tried to run away from them. One of them stabbed me in the back, and I went down the ground. And I actually still have a rock embedded in my hand where I fell on the ground. And uh, I'm laying there, I roll over my back like a really manly Canadian and start kicking and screaming, ah, leave me alone! <laughs> and I had been in, in Brazil for about a week and I knew some Portuguese and so I thought, try and remember as this is all happening in slow motion and going, death is going to kill me if I die down here. <laughs> and, and I think, how do I say stop or please stop or something in Portuguese? And I, it came to me, I finally remember and I went, obrigado, obrigado, obrigado! And I, and I, they were looking at me, so they were kicking, and then, why is he saying that? It's so weird. And then just then I remembered, obrigado means thank you. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that, and then I remembered, I'm literally like scared to death and laughing inside. And so, 
it was a terrible experience. <laughs> but I remember thinking, what have I done? I've put myself in jeopardy by doing this foolish thing, and now I've got my kids and my wife who are left behind. I had like no insurance. They were, and I remember thinking, what a terrible father I am. And that cha- began to change my life as far as being a father, not depending upon them to become famous football players to make be famous, but my responsibility as a parent through that time, I almost died. Went on, did a bunch of work here. I'll close now with a time that I cried. So this is a picture of our family. I think this may have been my, my graduation or somebody's graduation or somebody's wedding. Somebody, something was happening. We all had flowers on, I'm not sure why, uh, on the left-hand side. And then in 1994 is a picture on the right-hand side of, of, of the rest what's left of our family. And it's, of course, it's a picture without my mom. And I got a phone call. It was a month before Kristen was born, my second daughter. And my dad said, mom's not doing good. You should come home. And she wasn't like ill. She had diabetes, but she wasn't like really, really ill. So it was kind of a shock, but I was able to get up there. And I remember I got there kind of late. Uh, she was in the hospital in Lethbridge, went into the room, and I didn't even recognize her. She had gotten gangrene in her legs, and she was, she was in bad shape and lost a lot of weight. And uh, boy, it was pretty dram- traumatic for me. And she was unconscious. She was basically in a coma. And I thought, that's terrible. And then because I had just gotten there, everybody left. It was just me and her. And uh, I was just sitting there just watching her, not knowing what to say. And she woke up. Now, I wish I could say we had this magical moment where we had this conversation and she forgave me for being a bad kid or whatever. But she, she was really groggy. But she knew I was there and I saw her smile. She cried a little bit. And, um, and then I, I, don't know, I said, I don't know what to do. Uh, and there's a Bible laying there. I said, do you want me to read to you? She said, yeah, read to me. And we weren't a really uh, a strong Christian family. We weren't people of faith. We didn't go to church. She just wanted me to read to her. So I opened the Bible kind of randomly and I started reading stuff out of there. I'm not even sure what I read to her. And she fell asleep. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'll just come back and we'll do it again tomorrow. And so I went to my aunt's house to have some dinner with my family. And the doctor called and said, your mom has passed away. And I cried after that. Like, I went outside and was kind of sad. But I cried after that. And I cried because I didn't tell her what I'm telling you about the impact that she made in my life and how much I appreciated that. And I wished, I wish every day that I could go back and tell her that. I wish I could tell everyone who's on that list how much they mean to me. And I can, they're still here. Some of the ones who invested in me are not. I could list, I could have had 15 people on that list. I could have had 100 people on that list, people who invested in my life. Some of them are gone. But I try to remember to go back and tell them the impact they had in my life. All she remembers from me is that I left, I moved to the States, I left her behind, I never called. Uh, I was ungrateful for the goalie equipment that she bought me that I didn't know about and so on. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't the good son she deserved and I never had a chance to tell her that. So I cried because of that. I also I cry at Taylor Swift songs. (laughs) Almost 15 gets me every time. Can't help myself. So I cried, I almost died, tried to commit suicide, and I lied. That's my life, but people changed my life. I'm almost done here. That's you guys right there. (laughs) You got almost done, thank goodness. But I'm going to give you some homework. First, I'm going to ask you to think about someone that you might affect, someone whose life you might change. Who in your life might you change, whose life you might change? This is me. This is like, who would help this kid, this chubby <laughs> kid wearing a turtle? I never wear turtlenecks now ever because in my mind, that's the picture I have. And this kid looks scared to death. And, and my gosh, who wears those tuxedos anymore? But somebody, people who didn't, would never see me again invest in my life, I've never forgotten that. And I have this picture in my office that reminds me of uh, the Oklahoma tradition of patting the play like a champion today when you walk outside your office. I actually placed this outside there. It's a scripture from from Proverbs that says that the responsibility of the powerful is to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, to protect those uh, who are helpless and poor and needy and to be righteous. And every time I leave my office, I tap that and remind myself that I need to be standing up and affecting other people's lives. Second, you already know people who have affected your life. It's a chance to say thanks to them. They may not even know that they affected your life. I wrote Mr. McNinch who's actually Dr. McNinch. I didn't know he was a doctor until I tracked him down like a, like a stalker. And, 
And I wrote him and said, you changed my life. You said that thing in the seventh grade. And he wrote back and said, no, it was the 10th grade. You were never in the seventh grade in my class. And so, and uh, he corrected everything I got wrong. <laughs> but he didn't correct what I said because he didn't remember saying it. And he said, I don't remember that, but I kind of remember you. And he says, I've been toiling in the field of education for 30 years now. And you have, proved, you have so vividly proved the point that teachers make impacts on students without ever knowing it. I remembered your name and even recognized <laughs> from your own website at the University of Oklahoma, of all places, your face. Uh, but he had no idea the impact he had in my life. And there are people in your lives that have no idea how you've changed them. So I've given you all a card. And uh, I, would, I really encourage you to write someone's name at the top who's still alive. Write them a note sometime tonight. Put an envelope, mail it to me. You don't know how you will change their life by getting that letter. I was walking across campus yesterday, and a young man tracked me down. He's an ROTC. He's graduating this year. I literally cannot remember his name. He said, Dr. D, remember me? I was in your intro class. I said, yeah, I can't remember your face. And he says, man, I'm graduating because of you, what you did for me. And I was like, I have no idea what I did for you. But he, I, something I did, did something. And, and that's a moment I'll never, I, I don't remember his name but I'll never forget that moment where he told me what I did for him. And I remembered when he told me that, Dr. Crouch sitting in his car saying, someday you'll be in the driver's seat, someone else will be over here. So I'm gonna go over here, close with this. Uh, I'm gonna hand things over to, to Nancy who's gonna close, close us now. Remember, you've got two lessons. Think about who you can help. Second, thank someone who helped you. Nancy, it's all yours. Thank you.